there was me walking down the corridor and I'm greeted by this amazing selfie, which is Professor Matt Collins. <laughs> Where was this? In Southampton at the National Ocean Centre. That is it's the best selfie I've ever seen, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you know that feeling where you see something that is so good that you wonder why you even bother trying to do it yourself? That's very much the feeling I just got watching Bill Wirtz's uh, History of the World. Like, if you haven't seen it, Oh my god, it's amazing. There's, there's no point in me doing this anymore. So this is another green section of campus that you haven't seen before. Um, at lunchtime I am going off to the gym. Um, I've actually gone to the gym and, and lifted weights quite a few times. Um, whilst filming the vlog, I've just not captured it up until now. So Exeter has some pretty amazing sports facilities. They spent like 10 million pounds on the gym, or something crazy. And you've already seen bits of it, like that's the tennis courts that Dan and I played in before. Um, but they've got kind of facilities for basically every sport that's played in the UK. It's it's kind of amazing actually. That's where I'm going though, the weight cave. Man, look at all these people who have got exams. LOL, that used to be me. I haven't taken any, like a proper paper exam since 2012. Or was it 2013? 2013. I just have one massive scary one at the end of the PhD instead. But you can blag through that. You can't exactly blag on a paper exam about physics. I much prefer my way. <laughs> now with the workout done, I've got to get some of that sweet, sweet fuel. No. So let's say you're underwater and you have a cube, and you know the direction and speed that the water's moving in, then you can ask yourself a question. How much water is in this cube, and is that amount of water changing? So the amount of water in the cube is pretty easy to work out. You just multiply the width, the height, and the depth by the density of water, which we represent by the Greek letter rho. And I can tell you that no matter where these arrows are pointing, and they can be pointing in all different directions, be all different sizes, um, for water, as we physically know it, the amount of water in that cube, as long as the cube stays the same size, isn't going to change. And that's because water is an incompressible fluid. If you push down on water, the density of it isn't going to change. Actually, it does slightly at the very bottom of the ocean, but for our intents and purposes, it's a constant density throughout. So rho is the same wherever you're looking. And furthermore, the flow, the, how the water's moving, is what we call non-divergent. Water isn't just being like appearing like in Minecraft or something, uh, like a point where water is just spontaneously spouting out, or equally um, a point where water is just vanishing. You know, when we think of water vanishing like going down a drain, the water isn't vanishing, it's just moving from where you're holding it to somewhere else. The water itself isn't ever destroyed or created. If we weren't underwater, and these arrows now represented where air was moving instead of where the water was moving, then we have a more interesting problem because the density of air can vary in both time and space. In other words, the air here is of a different density than the air in the stratosphere, you know, 20,000 meters up. So depending on the flow, the amount of air, and by the amount of air, I mean the mass of air in this cube could change over time. This can be written in what's known as the continuity equation, which looks like this, such that the rate of change of density equals the uh, negative divergence of the momentum field. So in other words, um, the momentum, if anything, is just the mass times the velocity. This is the density times the velocity field, so those arrows before. And this is the idea of something springing out of nothing or disappearing into something, um, the divergence. So when we said that it was a divergence-free flow, or non-divergent flow, it means that this is zero. Let's zoom in for dramatic effect. Now this is one of the most fundamental equations in fluid dynamics, um, and there is no way that it is wrong. It's absolutely right. Um, and what I've been doing um, over the past couple of months, I guess, was just basically double checking that this equation applied over an average that we were considering, because we are considering uh, the pressure averaged over the whole North Pole area, from 65 degrees north to the pole. And effectively, I was tasked by myself with checking that this equation held when you're considering the density of air in that area and the flow, uh, the, the boundaries. So in other words, the, the north-south velocity into or out of the area. This had to add up. And up until today, it, it really didn't. Now, the reason it didn't work was because of a subtlety that completely passed me by. 
So something that I mentioned before is that uh, climate data is supplied on pressure surfaces. So say you're interested in how temperature changes as you go up. Then you know that the temperature will decrease uh, up to a point when you hit the, uh, the tropopause and then it will stay the same approximately. Um, now the way that you can do that is you could say at um, one kilometer up it's this value. It could be, I don't know, like 200 60 Kelvin or something like that, and then uh, two kilometers up and, and so on and so forth um, is such that you're measuring on a regular grid like one kilometer, two kilometers, three kilometers above the surface. But this often isn't done because uh, the equations that we use in the atmosphere are easier to work with if they're on what, what they're called, iso if they're in isobaric form, which means that you're holding pressure as constant. What that means is that instead of the vertical axis being uh, height, it's uh, pressure. So you say that at a uh, thousand hectopascals, which is roughly sea level, uh, the temperature is say 270 Kelvin or minus 3 uh, Celsius. And then you decrease the pressure. Let's say that at um, 300 hectopascals, the temperature is 240. Kelvin, I'm making this up. But the point is that you're saying at, instead of saying at this height, the temperature equals this, you're saying that at this pressure, the temperature equals this. Now, if you wanted to go back to considering the temperature as a function of height, you would need to know the height of these pressure surfaces. So where above the ground is it equal 1000 hectopascals? And you can do that through a variable called the geopotential. So you can get data sets where it says the 1000 hectopascal pressure surface at this part on the globe, so at like, I don't know, the 2nd of January um, at 60 degrees north and 20 degrees west, it has a geopotential of this. And that varies all around the Earth and it varies in time. And you can get the height of the pressure surface from that just by dividing the geopotential by G, the gravitational constant. This is where the subtlety comes in and also why I've drawn land under here. Because I thought um, my entire academic career, um, that the geopotential was measured relative to the, gr the ground. So if you had a mountain, it meant that the geopotential was measured relative to that. So that like the geopotential equals zero surface is the ground. But it's not, it turns out. It turns out that it's actually measured relative to sea level. So if there's land in the way, it means that the geopotential of the land surface is greater than zero. And of course, if you're over the sea, then the geopotential equals zero surface is sea level, it's the ground. So the code that I was writing to check the continuity equation was effectively um, changing from pressure coordinates back to high coordinates by, by doing this and considering the pressure surfaces and the height that they're at and then doing some funky maths. But it wasn't working out. For some reason, the, uh, the prediction of, of how much air was in our cube, which was over the North Pole, um, was changing over time um, in a way that didn't match up with what you'd expect from the air that flowed in and out of it. And it turned out it was because I was um, interpolating, I was, I was basically doing this, this conversion from pressure to height coordinates, assuming that this was zero on the ground rather than at sea level. And um, it meant that the difference looked like a seasonal cycle. So now that I've coded in that, this correction and changing it so that I don't use um, surface pressure at the bottom of my, my, my pressure data set and I'm actually using sea level pressure, suddenly it works. And it's the most minor of, of things um, that completely stumped me for quite a few weeks. So there's a lesson here to all PhD people, and you know, specifically in climate, I guess. Look at what your variables mean and where they're measured relative to, because it does make a big difference. But you learn by mistakes. So, you know, I'm better off for knowing it. And a few weeks further down the line. Now that I've implemented that, I've left it running overnight uh, to do like a long run because I've checked a little tiny part of the data set um, and I want to be able to check uh, at least several years worth. So, it's time for me to go home. So Dan's having some people over later, which means he has been engaging in literally his favorite activity in the world, which is cleaning. And my God, the house is absolutely spotless. Why not the best housewife ever? You're a pretty good housewife, mate. Right, off to chapel choir. Dan refuses to believe that that's the sun. It's not the sun, mate. <laughs> that is definitely the sun. Do you have a message for your adoring fans, Hugo? I love you all. Stay cool. Don't be like Hugo. Hey.
We do actually sing together. If you want to give me some music to suggest, oh, Magnum for the Bolton. Magnifico.